بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله المختار المصطفى المهند. This is Hamza again, and today's lecture we're going to talk about the Umayyads, Banu Umayya, Al Khilafa Al Umayya. This is the third lecture in our series, so we're already a fourth way done. Ahlan wa sahlan assalamu alaykum ya tullab al So, like I said, talking about the Umayyads. And this piece of art here um, very accurately describes Umayyad culture. This was the type of art and murals that they had in their palaces and vacation homes. That's very characteristic of Umayyad art. Um, they did paint pictures of uh, humans and various creatures. That one right there is in Damascus. And um, if you want to do some further reading, you have The Prophet and the Age of the Caliphates by Hugh Kennedy. You see right here. Um, it covers both Umayyad and Abbasid history pretty in depth. You also have The Venture of Islam by Marshall Hodgson. And then uh, for Muawiyah in particular, you have this biography of him, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan from Stephen Humphrey. So those are some easily accessible Orientalist literature that is in English that I don't really see it having major histori historiographical problems, um, but there still is some issues, but it's definitely by far uh, way less issues than a lot of other books. And of course, Tariq al-Tabari is a really good source or uh, Akbar Shah Najib Abadi's book, A History of Islam, is pretty good. Um, so yeah, those are kind of some of the main sources that I've uh, used here, as well as some other uh, secondary readings that I've done. And um, this lecture by Hugh Kennedy, it's three hours. It's just something if you want to watch on your own time, you're more than welcome to. I really like it because he goes in depth in um, the Zubayrids. So we're going to learn about the Zubayrids and how they were fighting the Umayyads. So when the Umayyad Caliphate got started, it was started in civil war, basically, and a lot of turmoils will come to find out. And so we're going to start with Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, because, of course, he is the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty. And he is the son of Abu Sufyan, who, as we know, was one of the big oligarchs of Mecca and one of the enemies of Islam prior to his conversion. They both uh, converted either after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah or some reports say after Fetah Mecca. So uh, that gives them the status of being Taliqs. And Taliq, uh, as we mentioned before, is kind of a lower status than the Muhajirin and Ansar. And Muawiyah's reign was from 661 Gregorian to 680. So he had a good long run of 19 years. And because of that, we're, I'm going to spend a good chunk on Muawiyah and his the kind of direct uh, descendants and the successor of the Marwanids. Um, because I feel like they laid down the foundation of Umayyad culture and how the Umayyad dynasty works. So that's why we're going to be focusing on Muawiyah and uh, his son and grandson uh, more than the other caliphs and uh, Marwan bin al-Hakam because they set the tone and the foundation for the Umayyad dynasty as it will be shown here. And so Muawiyah was made governor of Jordan under Amr bin al-Khattab and uh, later all of Sham. And so he moved to Damascus during that time, Damascus. And uh, during Uthman's reign, he, you know, being a relative of Uthman, you know, he was able easily to keep his position. And he was also competent in that position. There was no reason to get rid of him anyways because uh, he was doing a good job and the Syrians were very loyal to him. And so, you know, he had built all kinds of alliances and political experience um, 
as a governor. And so really, uh, you know, he had 20 years of governorship and then 20 years of being caliph or 19 technically. So, I mean, he had a lot of political experience. He uh, knew how to gather support from his own local uh, constituents. And Muawiyah, he wanted to bring Earthman's murderers to justice. You know, that was his rallying point, whatever his motivations were behind that, Allahu A'lam. And we want to think the best about all the Sahaba, have husnul bun, always a good assumption. Um, but that was his claim, is going to bring Earthman's murderers to justice, even though there was no eyewitness. As remember, uh, Earthman's wife was uh, technically uh, blind or had extremely poor eyesight. And uh, we know the Battle of Sulfin, as it's also known as Al-Fitna Al-Kubra. Civil war between Muawiyah and Ali, where Muawiyah uh, essentially became the de facto caliph after Ali's assassination. And Muawiyah was six years younger than Ali, so they were relatively the same age, radiallahu anhumah. And so Muawiyah quickly restored unity to the Arab elite, mostly the uh, Qurayshis, different clans of Quraysh. And this Arab elite, these uh, conquerors, you know, um, Muslim Mujahideen essentially, um, they were a minority, a ruling elite over a plebeian non-Arab populace. So, you know, people in the Middle East were uh, Syriac, Assyrian, um, they were Coptic, and these different types of things, Persian, you know, et cetera, et cetera, Greek speaking maybe. And, you know, they weren't ethnic Arabs and they did not uh, necessarily speak Arabic. If they did, it was only as a lingua franca for administrative kind of governmental purposes, but it's not what people spoke in their daily lives, except, of course, for the ethnic Arabs and the Arabized Arabs, the Musta'ariba. And, um, you know, he had a strong support with the elites of Quraysh against Ali in the first place. And because uh, the Quraysh, you know, who's this very political uh, tribe, saw that Muawiyah was politik. He, you know, was very good at politics. And, um, you know, he kept some of Ali's appointed uh, governors in Iraq in their positions like Ziyad bin Abihi. And Muawiyah was the first caliph to create a civilian militia called a shurta. Um, contemporary Arabic society, modern times, a shurta means police. But uh, this was before the emergence of modern police, and they were more like uh, citizens' militia, which um, was the norm in the medieval period. They weren't soldiers that went, you know, to do a revolt in the front lines, but rather they were like a domestic force to keep order. And typically, they were rarely used. Often, the muhtasab or which is the market uh, enforcer for the souk or uh, some sort of uh, different type of tax collector um, would be a direct governmental presence in people's lives and then of course you also have uh, you know the qadi the village judge or city judges you know that would uh, be a presence you know in society as well as their investigators so the shurta, the militia, was really kind of like, I think of it as our, like, akin to the National Guard that we have here in the United States. It's kind of like this backup uh, force that isn't very often utilized. And they enf enforced, enforced uh, curfews, basic criminal law, 
and enforce the market. So sometimes the muhtasab was subsumed under the shorta. Sometimes they were like a separate uh, department and markets were regulated. Um, we remember that Umar bin al-Khattab anhu fixed market prices in extreme cases uh, like during famine and things like that. Um, sometimes also these uh, night watchers were called haris. Um, in the United States, uh, in the co colonial United States, before the abolition of slavery, um, we had that same system actually of, of night watchers and lamplighters and things like that. So that wasn't something that changed until the later half of the 19th century where you had the emergence of actual police. So I just want to be clear that shorta doesn't necessarily mean a police. Um, and sharta, the root, means to make uh, conditions, right, like in fiqh. And uh, Muawiyah also introduced the neighborhood watchman or doorman called Bawab. So even nowadays, like uh, when I was living in Egypt, um, they would have these kind of, uh, it's like a little structure. It's big enough for one person to sit in with like a little dome on top. Um, police will often sit in it and watch the neighborhood. Um, and so the Bawab kind of functioned that way, um, as well as there, like in an apartment building, you'd have a Bawab who usually their apartment is kind of like uh, near the main entrance on the bottom floor. They're kind of like a maintenance man. They watch and they oversee things in the building. Um, you know, they might be involved with different, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, property management activities and so this was a tr this was like a tradition that goes back to Muawiyah and um, Muawiyah was authoritarian by ideology he believed in a strong central government however you couldn't really enforce that in those days in the medieval period uh, just due to the limitations of technology like nowadays we live in what's called the surveillance state where they have technology to really monitor what each citizen does and therefore an autocratic government can have a lot of power and control over an individual whereas in late antiquity early medieval period it was much more uh, libertarian or anarchist the government didn't really unless you, if you lived especially like in a small village or out in the country the government really had little to no presence in your daily life except when it came to maybe uh taxes and when you go to the market and things like that maybe maybe but if you lived in the city uh especially the a capital city or a very large city there would definitely be more of a government presence but still nothing compared to what we see today and so that's just important to keep in mind that the traditional caliphate was always a very um, anarchist or uh, libertarian um, institution. And that's why I say here that classical Islamic politics or uh, economics was closer to what was called social anarchism or mutualism, uh, referring to mutual aid meaning that the government didn't have a strong presence in people's lives and people lived a very egalitarian collectivist life where tribal uh, connections were very important and local types of connections and mutual aid people helped each other quite a lot the rich would make endowments or awqaf singular is waqf um, which was more or less like what we would call a non-profit today where any profit that was generated from the whatever type of waqf it was would be donated to a charitable cause and uh, about 60 percent of uh, all the land of muslim lands across the muslim empire um, was tied up in al-qaf so it may these this kind of like social welfare uh, from the al-qaf made up a huge part of the economy and it was uh what kept people from starving 
what kept people off the streets, I mean, like being homeless, yani, or um, what allowed them to go and get uh, health care for free from hospitals as they developed in the Islamic Empire, and things like that, right? So the, the waqf system um, was very important to Islamic society, civilization. And if you want uh, more information on that, I can recommend some, some books on that topic. Um, that really is how it historically functions, so it's, it's quite important to, to know that, as well as uh, market prices being fixed uh, and uh, not allowing price gouging and things like that is all part of Islamic economics. So it's not laissez-faire capitalism. It's not communism either. It's something a little different, right? And Muawiyah, he was known as the first Umayyad because obviously his tribe is Ben Umayyah. Um, but he wasn't uh, Napotic like Uthman. Um, you know, he sometimes would appoint someone from his own uh, clan of Quraysh to a position of power if they were exceptionally qualified. Um, but he would just appoint whoever seemed qualified, really. And most of Ben Umayya um, stayed in the Hejaz, and most of them were quite wealthy. Um, during the first, you know, Fitna al Kubra, um, a lot of them had taken refuge in Damascus, but it seems like that during uh, Muawiyah's reign, which remember was 19 years, it seems like they all kind of went back to the Hejaz. And Muawiyah did appoint candidates from the Ansar to positions of power. Or he did not, rather. He did not appoint people from the Ansar, the Aus and Khazraj tribes, to positions of power. Really, he favored the Muhajirin. And the Muhajirin, Islamically, did have a higher status. Um, but that might be seen as a point of contention. Um, certainly, the Ansar felt... Uh, probably uh, marginalized by this, but you also have to remember that the Ansar were the big core supporters of Ali's caliphate, right? They were part of Shi'at Ali, Ali's party of followers, right? Um, so probably Muawiyah didn't trust them. That's, that's my guess. And so Muawiyah's uh, administration here. That's a picture of him. That's one of his own dirhams, silver coins that he uh, commissioned. And it is in the Sasanid style, but that's supposed to be a portrait of Muawiyah. And he wasn't known particularly for his piety or religious authority in the historical sources, um, but he was known for his wealth was known for being uh, very educated and a you know political genius. Um, and like, like I mentioned before, that he was a taliq. And he was known for his self-control, hum, which is also translated to forbearance, shrewdness, and moderation. And this was a virtue that the pre-Islamic Arabs held in high esteem. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, when you look at the akhlaq literature and adab literature, the different hadiths about akhlaq and adab, you know, character and manners, um, much of uh, these pre-Islamic values, uh, like uh, muru'a, um, like chivalry and valor and things, the this, this system, it's kind of it, r reminiscent of Bushido. If you're familiar with Bushido in, in, in uh, medieval Japan, Kind of the samurai code of ethics, this uh, Muru'a um, code of ethics was kind of similar, and you know a good majority of it agreed actually with Islamic ethics. So, you know, hum is something that is still, you know, a virtue in Islamic ethics. A lot of that stuff was retained. Um, Muawiyah he was famous for having very loyal soldiers. And they were mostly Muslim, but also Christian Arabs, uh, you know, the uh, Ghassanids, essentially. And um, the caliphate 
during Muawiyah's time was an imperial power and not necessarily based on religious authority. Like Muawiyah wasn't looked at as a religious figure uh, during his time, like a religious leader uh, per se. Um, some might have, but a lot didn't. And, uh, you know, they would look to basically uh, different Sahaba or Tabi'een as the, like, shiuch or ulama of the time, right? And his military force was known as the most disciplined amongst the Arabs. And um, he had military experts who previously served under the Byzantine Empire and uh, the Sassanid Empire as well. Um, the fact that we have his portrait here on a silver coin in the Sassanid style shows that there were Persian, you know, Sassanid, or maybe they were Lachmi, um, Sassanid kind of artisans here who were working under Muawiyah. And Muawiyah sought to emulate what was already in the milieu of the Near East. He wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel per se. It's also interesting here too, you see there's a, a crescent and moon there. So that is something, um, there's another one here that uh, goes very far back in the Islamic tradition. And it says here, Bismillah, Bismillah. So it doesn't say Bismillah rahman rahim but it does for sure you can make out Bismillah right here so they did try to islamicize the coin but the artistic style is still you could tell that this was a sasanid uh, craftsman of some type i don't know what ethnicity but clearly from the sasanid empire that made this coin <laughs> and speaking of money muawiyah was famously good with money um like uthman and he reorganized and restructured the taxes for the empire so he was uh like a fiscal genius as well as a political genius, right? He was just very good administrator. And he brought in tons of revenue for the state because he raised taxes significantly. And a lot of state revenue came from Ghanima, war booty, um, especially from raids on the Byzantines and Anatolia, modern day Turkey, uh, where at, during that time, Anatolia was entirely Greek speaking. Um, so it's really interesting if you read um, uh, the sections that survive from Imam al-Awza'i's book, Siyar al-Awza'i. Um, and remember, Awza'i was based in Damascus. And uh, he fought jihad on the front lines against the Byzantines. He mentions in his book, you know, that they would find, um, and you'll see this maybe in your reading, um, that they would find texts in uh, Greek and they wouldn't know what to do with them, like books that were in Greek, um, so they would bury them because they didn't know if it was a religious text or not, like a Bible or something. Um, so they were, most of the Siyara Awza'i is uh, regarding uh, rules of jihad, the fiqh of jihad and ghanima. Almost all of it's about ghanima or war booty and how you divide it, what stuff you can keep and not keep. Like if you find this book in Greek, what do you do with it? You can't keep it. You're supposed to bury it in the desert. Um, and portions of it survive through uh, the refutation by Abu Yusuf, one of the students of Abu Hanifa. He has a book, Rad ala Siyar al-Awza'i. And then you just have the book Siyar al-Awza'i from his student, Al-Fazari. So, um, but it's not the full version. There's pieces of it missing. Um, but we do have a good chunk of what Imam al-Awza'i uh, thought about in terms of uh, fiqh al-jihad or fiqh al-ghanima. And um, then you have later on Tabari, the same Tabari who we read, you know, with his book Tariq al-Tabari. He has this book, Ikhtilaf al-Fuqaha, Difference of Opinion Amongst the Jurists, um, where he would narrate a lot of the fiqh opinions of Imam al-Awza'i. Later on, uh, Ibn Rushd, or Averroes, as he's known from Islamic Spain, he wrote this book, Badayat al-Mujtahid, uh, the beginning of the uh, independent jurist. Um, and it's a, it's a book that talks about difference of opinion in fiqh. And it's, 
when you train to be a mufti, it's like requ requ required reading. I'm personally training right now to be a Hanafi uh, mufti. And this book um, also, you can see a lot of the different opinions of Imam al-Awza'i. So just food for thought. Um, Imam al-Awza'i lived at the very end of the Umayyad Empire, and he witnessed actually the Abbasid Revolution. So he wasn't alive during the time of Muawiyah, but you can still see that a lot of what was go what was on people's minds during the Umayyad period was military expansion, ghanima, um, taxes, um, even right away uh, in the Abbasid uh, Empire, Abu Yusuf writes this book, you know, Kitab al-Kharaj, you know, tax book, um, which, uh, you know, is, uh, there's a sh big sharh written on it by later scholars and things like that, like Al-Jasas. Um, so this was like the important stuff of the day um, that kind of took priority, if you will. And um, Muawiyah, even though he wasn't known for his piety, um, that doesn't necessarily mean he was impious either. It's just he wasn't known for it, right? Um, but he did care about Islam. That that much, I think, is clear. Um, you know, he did squash certain Islamic preachers that disrupted the community um, with ideas that he did not agree with. And he did think that the caliph should have authority as given by God. Um, and he did view himself as representative of the whole Muslim jama'a. Ah, but uh, a lot of the Muslims of the time did not recognize him as a religious authority, even though he viewed himself as one. So that's kind of important to remember. During his reign, he focused his uh, military on raiding the Byzantines to the north, Constantinople in particular. He also expanded territory in Khorasan, and uh, he went past Khorasan, and he went into uh, Turkic speaking areas in Central Asia. Um, they breached into Sindh, which is like more modern day uh, Pakistan and India, um, as you can see um, down here. And, you know, still Anatolia here um, was hard to penetrate through, mainly because of the terrain is, you know, it's tough terrain there. If you've ever been to Turkey, it's it's mountainous and hilly, and it's hard to march an army through, right? Um, but they did take the island of Cyprus, and they were, you know, having a navy trying to, you know, bombard Constantinople, but Constantinople has a giant wall and is very well fortified, right? And then um, I think it was during Muawiyah's time as well that um, they did reach uh, pretty much Algeria, all of Algeria, I think Morocco came a little bit later. Um, and they did send ships down and um, made Somalia a uh, suzerainty. So Somalia had to pay taxes to the caliphate during Muawiyah's time. Um, and it was known that there was a lot of Muslims there already. So um, that should also be highlighted here, but I just don't think enough people know about that. Um, but it's Somali historians talk about it in their own history books. I, I speak some Somali, so I'm, I read their history books. Um, and so we've got uh, Crete and Rhodes from the Greek uh, islands, as well as Cyprus, of course. And um, Egypt and Shem have always kind of been tied together with this connection. And it goes all the way back to Muawiyah, where Egypt was controlled sort of as an appendage of Syria. Um, not too many Arabs settled in Fustat, which became later on Cairo, um, or Alexandria. And in fact, even to this day, when you do DNA testing of uh, modern Egyptians, uh, they typically have a very low percentage of ethnic Arab DNA from the peninsula or uh, from northern Arabia, like, you know, Sham and Iraq. Typically, they're just genetically North African. They're much, 
they're much more closely related to the Berbers of uh, Libya, Algeria, Tunis, and, and things like that. So uh, that's just something to uh, keep in mind. And so these patterns of settlement and migrations that, that took place during this initial Islamic uh, conquest still to this day shapes the genetic makeup of uh, these territories. So we mentioned earlier that, uh, or actually maybe not earlier, but I'm mentioning it now, that uh, 50,000 Arab troops had settled in Khorasan. They you know, plowed their way through Persia and conquered Persia and settled um, in Khorasan. You know, they settled basically in this area here. Um, and to this day, when they do genetic testing, you know, like My23 or what are the other ones, Ancestry.com, you know, Persian people, typically they're 50% or even more, like 60% uh, genetic Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula. So that's something important to know. It also plays a big part in politics because the Abbasid revolution was really sprung from the descendants of these 50,000 Arab troops. A lot of them married Persian wives and uh, became inter integrated in Persian society. They spoke Persian besides their native Arabic. They had learned Persian. Um, their descendants were bilingual with Arabic and Persian. Um, so they made up a, a important part of the empire, if you will, important constituency of the caliphate um, and very uh, unique uh, facet of Middle East history, right? And so his, he had his half-brother, um, Ziad bin Abihi, who was originally appointed as a governor of Iraq by Ali, radiallahu anhu, and Ziyad, um, presumably because he was the half-brother of Muawiyah, uh, got to keep that position. And um, they, I guess, became closer in their relationship. And Muawiyah started calling him Ziyad bin Abi Sufyan. Um, so he basically, uh, Abu Sufyan, had had uh, Ziad out of wedlock and um, did not claim him during his lifetime. And so he was just known as Ziad bin Abihi. That's what a foundling um, was called in Arabic society. Uh, and so Muawiyah kind of gave him this official title. No, I'm going to call you Ziad bin Abi Sufyan. And it's essentially acknowledging that you are my brother and I'm going to treat you accordingly. So um, Ziad uh, got this kind of, uh, I guess you could say political uh, boost as well as recognition by his blood brother. Um, so you can see that uh, Muawiyah was, he was politic. He knew what he was doing. He knew how to strengthen relationships. He knew how to strengthen bonds and things of like that. And by the way, I hope you like my Malcolm X hat. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a big part of Muawiyah's uh, caliphate or administration. And like I said, it sets the tone kind of for how the Umayyads will function afterwards. And uh, Muawiyah had officially appointed his son Yazid to succeed him on the throne. And this was long before he, he died from what I understand. Um, and he thought that Arab Muslims would not accept somebody else um, who isn't from, you know, the elite clans of Quraysh and doesn't have all these um, important political ties that Muawiyah had worked uh, 39 years cultivating. Um, and Muawiyah feared that these uh, tribes would uh, fall into civil war, and they later did, as we'll get to. So um, the Iraqis, Hejazis, and uh, Qurashi diaspora, they all uh, were vying for power behind the scenes. Imagine like the TV show Game of Thrones. Everybody's trying to get, get the throne, right? Um, people are jostling and doing different political stuff to get power. Um, but despite all of that, they outwardly 
um, gave bay'ah um, to Muawiyah's son Yazid when Muawiyah fell ill. So Muawiyah fell ill in 680 and died. Um, we don't know exactly what he died from. Um, but he, it's narrated that he begged his son, beseeched his son Yazid, to follow the examples of the rightly guided caliphs, the Khulafa Rashidin, even Ali, right? He held respect for Ali. Um, but Yazid refused. He was just like, no, I am not going to do that. And that he was just going to follow Quran and Sunnah. Basically, uh, he was saying, I'm just going to follow Quran and Sunnah, and I'm going to throw away the tradition of the Sahaba, which of course doesn't make any sense because the only way you know about the Quran and Sunnah is through the Sahaba, right? And um, Yazid was not a Sahabi, he was a Tabi, right? Um, so it's kind of a very strange mentality to have that Muawiyah, you know, uh, felt dismayed about, right? And even though Yazid was fully aware that his father was dying from this illness, illness, you know, on his deathbed, um, it said that during uh, Muawiyah's death, Yazid just went out hunting for pleasure. Um, he basically did not care that his father was dying, um, according to the different narrations, historical narrations. Um, and this is by Sunnis. This is not like a Shi'i polemic or anything. This is what's reported by Sunni sources. And Muawiyah was buried in Damascus with some of the hair of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and one nail of the Prophet Muhammad. So he clearly had some love for the Prophet وسلم, to be buried with relics of the Prophet. And it shows also that the you know, Sahaba were very careful with the relics of the Prophet وسلم. And uh, Muawiyah lives on in Sunni Hadith collections. Um, he narrated 163 Hadith. And in one of these Hadith, Muawiyah says, my success over Ali was because of four factors. I used to guard my secrets while Ali bin Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, disclosed everything to the people. My army was obedient while Ali's army was disobedient. I did not take part in the war between Ali and Aisha, radiallahu anhu. I was popular with the Quraysh while its people were displeased with Ali. We remember many clans of the Quraysh did not give bay'ah to Ali. And so this begins the reign of Yazid bin Muawiyah. And he reigned for three years, 680 to 683. It was extremely controversial. And I'm not going to get it deeply into the controversial uh, aspects um, just because it's too much. I mean, that alone could be its own class that could last the whole semester. Um, and I don't think it has a major impact on the way the Umayyad Caliphate functioned, although it might be brought up uh, in cultural memory during like the Abbasid revolution and, and the Shi'i century that, that we will get to. But essentially, um, Yazid went to go and intercept Hussein bin Ali who had um, left from Medina to go to Kufa because he felt in Medina he would not be safe and he went to Kufa where he thought um, you know his supporters would be the people who supported his father Ali were located and they would give him bay'ah and he would establish caliphate um, but he was intercepted at Karbala and um, killed by uh, Yazid bin Abihi. So remember, Yazid bin Abihi uh, was Muawiyah's half brother, um, and it was his son, Ubaidullah, 
um, that had taken over as like governor of, of this part of Iraq. And um, even though it's said that Yazid bin Muawiyah did not order Hussein to be killed, just intercepted rather. Um, so it's said that Ubaidullah um, basically on his own killed Hussein and his followers, band of his family and friends and close supporters, they were all massacred in what's known as the, you know, uh, massacre at Karbala, right? That um, this painting here, Persian painting, um, you know, that's from the Safavid era um, depicts Right, that's supposed to be Hussein radiallahu an, and um, that is supposed to be Ubaidullah bin Yazid bin Abihi or bin Abi Sufyan, right? Um, giving the fatal blow. Um, he beheaded Hussein, thinking that he would take the head of Hussein back to Yazid as a trophy, and. Uh, some narrations say that when Yazid uh, saw Hussein's head that he wept profusely and was quite uh, dismayed by this. And um, there are some Sunni narrations that say Yazid was directly involved and ordered this to happen. Um, there are also the Shia, of course, they go with all the narrations that Yazid intentionally did this. Um, so you have this kind of historiographical issue where uh, it's not quite so certain what happened. You have supporters to this day, people who support Yazid, say that he was innocent of this. And then you even have Sunnis who will say, no, Yazid uh, did wrong here. And then you'll have Shia who say Yazid's like the most evil person ever to exist. Um, so you kind of have a whole range of different uh, ideas there that are in the historical reports from the time, right? Um, and it's largely thought that the Fatimids later on, the Fatimid dynasty that ruled over Egypt, um, ha had gotten a hold of uh, Hussein's uh, head and they buried it. الآن يأتي رجل ما أدري سمعت ولا ما سمعت في أول محرم مفت الديار السعودية الشيخ عبد العزيز آل الشيخ في قناة المجد يصرح أن بيعة يزيد كانت بيعة شرعية أخذها أبوه في حياته وأن الحسين غرر به ومن قام ضد يزيد كان مخطئا بيعة يزيد بن معاوية بيعة شرعية بيعة شرعية أخذها أبوه له في حياته أخذها أبوه له في حياته تبايعه الناس وقبلوا بيعته ولما توفي امتنع الحسن الحسين بن علي وابن الزبير عن المبايعة وابن عمر أول ثم بايع ابن عمر وامتناع الحسين وابن الزبير رضي الله عنه عن بايعته وعن بايعة لشبهة عرضت لهم كانوا في ذلك رضي الله عنهما غير مصيبين لأن بيعة يزيد بيعة شرعية وبيعة أخذت له في حياة أبيه وأعطاه المس بيعتهم ولكن الله حكيم عليه بما قضى وقدر تلك أمور مضت نسأل الله أن يعبو عجل هذه مسائل مضت والتواريخ كلها تحكي القضية بأساري مختلفة فمن التواريخ من يقوم عن جنوح لبعض الشيء ومنهم من يحرض الدين ذلك هذه مسألة مضت مضى يزيد ومضى الحسين ولهم أكثر من ألف وتقريب ألف وسبعين وألف وسبعين سنة أمر انتهى ما في ضمن التنقيص الآن والتغيير لكن أعتقد أن يزيد بن معاوية بيعته بيعة شرعية وأن الحسين رضي الله عنه وأرضاه نصح أن لا يخرج إلى العراق وأن لا يقبل من دعهم البيعة وحذره ابن عباس وابن عمر والفرزق 
وكثير من الصحابه حذروه من الخروج الى العراق واخبروه ان ان بدر في يزيد وان الخروج لا يؤدي لمصلحه لكن رضي الله عنه اراد الله ما اراد وقضى الله ما قضى واذا نفذ القضاء فلا رد له لكن نذر الله عز وجل ونحن نذر العفو عن الجميع ولله بما قضى وقدر حكمه لا يعلم الا الله اذا قلت من حسين اقطع ما اقطع او يتقطع ما بعد من الان عند الموضوع على السنه والجماعه عقيدتهم وجوب الانقياد لمن بويع وان من بويع واجتمعت الكلمه عليه وجب على الجميع السمع والطاعه له وحرم الخروج عليه حرم الخروج الحسين رضي الله عنه وعرضه ويكن من يحب ان يحدث ذلك العدل لما القي السؤال نقول حسين رضي الله عنه وعرضه في خروجه كان كان الامر خلافا ما يريد وكان عدم الخروج هو الاولى والبقاء هو الاولى والدخول بما دخل الناس هو الاولى لكنه غرر فيه وغرر فيه وغرر فيه وغرر فيه وقيل ان العراق كلهم معه وان بيع الدين انتظمت الى اخره فظن صدق ما يقولون وحقيقه ما يقولون واقع لا واقع ان العراق والشام ومصر والحجاز وقوى اليمن وسائر البلاد قد اعطوا البيعه ليزيد بن معاويه في حياه ابيه واصبح اماما محترفا به لا يجوز الخروج عليه ولا التعدي على خلافته هذا هو الذي امر ولكن قدر الله نافذ باشد هذا كلام مفتي مفتي بلاد فيها مكه والمدينه مفتي بلاد النبي صلى الله عليه واله وسلم قدم فلذات اكباده في سبيل رايه التوحيد هناك انا اريد اساله انت بالصلاه تصلي على رسول الله وعلى اهل بيته باجماع المسلمين الذي لا يذكر اهل البيت في تشهده صلاته باطل باجماع المسلمين يسموها الصلاه الابراهيميه اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد اذا ما قال على ال سيدنا محمد صلاه باطله انا اسال هذا المفتي جناب المفتي اساله اقول له لما تقول ال محمد يشمل الامام الحسين لو ما يشمله هذا في نظرك مغرر به في نظرك اللي قتله كان رجل صالح وانت تسلم على هذه الضحيه او ما تسلم عليه او مثل بعض الناس اللي قالوا آل النبي يعني زوجاته عجيب يعني آل سعود زوجاتهم ولا أولادهم وأحفادهم أنت اللي يسموك عبد العزيز آل الشيخ يعني مرت أبوك لازم آل الشيخ مو أنت مو أنت كيف يجرأ رجل أن يقول أن بيعة يزيد كانت شرعية بيعة فرعون أيضا كانت شرعية بيعة نمرود أيضا كانت شرعية شلون تميزون الشرعية من غير الشرعية الامام الحسين من جملة اهدافه كان لمقاومة الظلم والعدوان اما هؤلاء فيشرعون للظلم يقول لك الظلم شرعي ما دام هو حاكم فهو على حق والذي يقاومه فهو على باطل الحسين خط احمر الحسين خط احمر الحسين خط احمر لبيك يا حسين I accidentally moved the slide forward there, which I wasn't trying to do. Uh, the, I was trying to show you, though, that they, they uh, buried it in Cairo, um, and that's what those pictures were there. That's supposed to be uh, where Hussein's head is buried. They call it Masjid uh, Imam Hussein, and that square there I was standing in, they call Maidan Imam Hussein. Um, it's also thought that Imam Hussein's head uh, rests in a shrine in Jordan. So there's there's uh, also it's said that it's in Karbala still to this day. So you have these disputed areas where um, it's really not sure um, where Hussein actually lies. And I think because of nationalism or tourism, or I'm not entirely sure uh, 
why um, these governments, nation state governments that rule in the places where these shrines are, um, they don't want to do any archaeological digging or uh, like anthropo like uh, anthropo how, how am I trying to say anthropological archaeology um, or like DNA testing to see you know is this really the head of Hussein that's buried here so it's it's not quite known which shrine is the one where Hussein is actually located at and it could be that you know his body is still in Karbala and the head is in Egypt and maybe some other relic of Hussein is in Jordan. Allahu a'lam. Um, but anyways, because of Karbala and Yazid's impiety, you know, he is known um, as a drunkard and a, a womanizer. You know, he it's reported that basically he just serially uh, committed zina. Even in Sunni sources, he was not well liked and some uh, orientalists and even uh, Muslim historians say well all the anti uh, Yazid or anti Umayyad sentiment that we find in these reports um, we have to kind of take them with a grain of salt because they were written down and compiled in books during the Abbasid period and of course the Abbasids are going to be anti Umayyad because they had a re revolution to overthrow the Umayyads. Um, so it's thought that maybe some of these things were uh, either blatantly made up in an attempt to discredit the Umayyads or characterized in not so great of a light because if you were pro-Umayyad, you might be persecuted by the Abbasid authorities. So that's just something important to keep in mind that people really didn't have freedom of speech when they were writing down history about the Umayyad dynasty. But this is what's reported, that Yazid was a drunkard, he drank wine all the time, and did zina all the time. And Abdullah bin Zubair, and Zubair bin al-Awam, the Sahabi, this is his son, um, questioned if Yazid was even a, a Muslim. like. Um, and declared jihad on Yazid. It's not quite sure why he thought he wasn't Muslim, because, you know, fisk, uh, major sin, or fasad, it doesn't uh, necessarily take you out of Islam. Um, it just means you're a very bad Muslim, but you're still a believer. You're still considered a Muslim. Um, so, maybe Yazid had said something that was tantamount to this belief. It's, it's really not clear. But basically, Abdullah bin Zubair um, declared jihad on him and thought that he wasn't Muslim. And it was predominantly Ansari clans who supported Abdullah bin Zubair. And um, that's important because, remember, they were also the main supporters of Ali, right? So they didn't want the Umayyads at any cost essentially and Zubair bin al-A'wam his father was martyred in Sufin so this was personal and many Qurashis in Mecca supported Abdullah bin Zubair and they called for a new, sh new shura to elect a new caliph so um, essentially they elected uh, Ibn Zubair right and nobody in the Muslim world wanted the, like, they, nobody around wanted a khilafa that was founded on lineage, that was going to be like dynastic, where father appoints son. People didn't want that. They wanted a more of a democratic republic approach where you had a shura, right? And the you know the concept of the shura existed in pre-islamic times it still exists in modern somalia they call it the gurti system so this is something that still exists uh mushawara or shura is something that still happens with uh traditional uh arab tribal chiefs even now right 
about certain issues. They get together and talk about certain issues. Even the, the you know, like Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan and these different, you know, enemies of Islam during the time of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they would get together, have a group discussion, a shura, about what to do with this new religion and how to defeat the Prophet Muhammad. Right? So, this was something that was considered like integral to uh, Arab culture and a part of Islam s sanctioned by the Sahaba, right? By, uh, you know, uh, Omar and uh, uh, Abu Bakr, right? And that's really what happened with the, at the Saqifah, the portico, with, with Abu Bakr in a sense, too. Um, and, you know, Ali was accused of departing from that. Um, and Muawiyah, by appointing his son, also departed from the Shura system, right? So most of the Arabs did not understand why this was happening, why people were abandoning the Shura. And really it was because I think that Muawiyah saw himself now as an imperial leader. He's not a leader of just the Arabs. He's a leader of an empire and he needs to behave like empires behave. So he coins his own coins like the Sassanids did. And um, he probably thought that uh, being dynastic was what empires did. And that's what he needed to do to keep the Islamic Empire going. Um, but to complicate matters, you have the Khawarij who uh, had deserted, remember, Ali's army. They uh, established control of all of the Arab Peninsula outside of the Hejaz, um, especially uh, eastern um, Arabia, what's, what's known as the province of Al-Ahsa, was very heavily dominated by the Khawarij up until the Ottoman period, essentially. That was Khawarij territory from the time of Yazid up until the Ottoman Empire, so a very long time. And they also established um, themselves in Algeria and Morocco and in Tunis as well, and uh, Libya. It was popular amongst the new Berber convert, converts because they probably didn't have a lot of uh, knowledge about Islam. And out in the Sahara, deep in the Sahara Desert, the you know uh, Umayyad government can't really reach that area. And they also uh, entrenched themselves in uh, up in the highlands or the mountainous lands of Persia where also the government couldn't easily reach. So any place the government couldn't easily reach became a refuge for every kind of uh, deviant group or outlaws and, and is like the Wild West of the Islamic Empire, if, if you will. And the Azraqis or the, the Blue Khawarij, they were the most violent and they killed any non Kharaji who dared cross their path. Um, whereas the Ibaldis, or the, the white um, branch of the Khawarij, basically said, al wala wal bara'a. Like, we disassociate from people who do not follow our system. We don't be friends with them. We separate ourselves and we segregate ourselves. And that's why they always thrived in these rural areas and they were like, you know, the violent fundamentalists of their day, or the terrorists of their day, to use that word pejoratively. Um, they were not well liked by anybody except themselves. And Yazid's reign, in other words, was full of all kinds of civil war and turmoil. So you have the Zubairids who are declaring their own uh, caliphate, and they're controlling the western part of the Arab Peninsula and they're expanding and then you have on the eastern side the Khawarij have their own territory as well as pockets elsewhere in the Caliphate and um, also a group of uh, Shia uh, supporting Muhammad ibn Hanafiya son of uh, Ali you know spring up in Kufa and so this time uh, during 
Yazid's reign was known as the second fit, fitras, or fitna. Sorry. So you have the fitna al-kubra, like the major fitna of, between Ali and Muawiyah, and then they call the second fitna this time that happened during Yazid's reign because the whole like Muslim empire broke into chaos and civil war, and the government seemed to have lost all control over the empire. And so the Umayyad army marched to quell the Zubayr uh, rebellion, and the Ahl al-Medina or Medanese, they dug a trench, just like during the Prophet Muhammad's times, right? Uh, the Battle of the Trench, Khandaq. And um, the Syrian army was just really big. Uh, their technology was much more sophisticated. They were way better well, well supplied. And easily conquered Medina. It was known as the Battle of Harra, Harra. And uh, that's the same root as, you know, Hurra, which means freedom, right? Harra. And Abdullah bin Zubair, he fled um, to Mecca and he took refuge in the Kaaba, thinking that was somehow uh, going to save him. Um, Yazid had his army march on the Kaaba and they used catapults and destroyed the, the city of Mecca and the Kaaba. Kaaba caught fire and um, it collapsed completely. Um, so it was uh, rebuilt um, during Yazid's uh, time. And, or right after his time, because he died actually during the siege of the Kaaba in the year 683 from some sort of illness. And um, he died at the age of 39 after a reign of only three years and eight months. Uh, and unlike his father, he was not politique, he was not politically savvy. He was known to be tyrannous and fraught with scandal. And he had a son who, whom he named Muawiyah bin Yazid. So this is Muawiyah bin Yazid bin Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. And he reigned for a whopping 40 days. Um, he was appointed as caliph and he was only 20 years old when he took that position and he was sickly his whole life um, it's not known really why not much is narrated about him uh, many of the Syrians gave him like bay'ah by default um, but he died after 40 days some say 60 some say it was 90 days but he, pretty much right afterwards he died which when that happens and you have uh, two leaders of an empire or even a country nowadays um, die like that quickly, it causes chaos. That's really how the, the Sassanid Empire collapsed is every appointee was dying right after the next. And it was political chaos. Nobody knew who to follow or what to do. Um, and, you know, information traveled much slower in those days by horse or camelback. And so uh, people didn't know who to report to like, you know, different uh, government administrators or military uh, administrators. And so on his deathbed, uh, he refused to select or appoint a successor. And he made his courtiers leave him and he died alone, which ended the Sufyanid branch of the Umayyads. So you have Abdu'l-Manaf, which is, uh, you know, ancestor in Quraysh, they go to Bani Hashim, right? Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in Abdul Shams over here, and then you have Umayyah over here. So everyone below this is Ben Umayyah. And so we had Uthman, who was the third caliph, you have Abu Sufyan, Muawiyah, Yazid bin Muawiyah, Muawiyah bin Yazid bin Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan, right? They make up the Sufyanid line of the Umayyads. And after Muawiyah II passed away, Marwan bin al Hakam, the right hand man of Uthman, took over. And the rest of the Umayyads are known as the Marwanid Umayyads. So, all of these green boxes down here were 
caliphs, right? Fam one of the most famous ones in uh, Umayyad history is Omar bin Abdul Aziz. He's also known as Omar II, uh, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So Marwan bin al-Hakam, the right-hand man of Uthman. He was not initially seen as a candidate for a caliph. Ibn Zubair gained widespread support. Um, he did not die during the siege of the Kaaba. I, uh, he survived from what I understand. Um, and the biggest contender with Ibn Zubair was the Khawarij, right? You had Ibn Zubair on one side of the Arabian Peninsula and the Khawarij on the other side. And that was really the two dominant powers because it seemed like the Umayyads completely collapsed, right? And they didn't know what to do. And the Syrians didn't know what to do. And Marwan himself was about to give bay'ah to Ibn Zubair, along with a lot of the other Syrians and Umayyad, you know, Ashraf, the elites of Quraysh were all thinking, hey, we're going to give bay'ah to Ibn Zubair. And the two main Arab tribes in Syria were called Qais and Banu Kalb. Banu Kalb were from Ahl al Yemen. They were Yemenis, and they were recent migrants to um, Syria. I believe that they settled there during the Islamic conquest. So Qais was already there before the Islamic conquest, right? And um, they disagreed as to pledging allegiance to Ibn Zubair. Qais wanted to appoint Khalid bin Yazid, which was uh, Muawiyah II's little brother, who was also very sickly, and he was prepubescent, so he was maybe like seven years old or something. And um, Banu Kalb, they were going to pledge allegiance to Ibn Zubair. But kind of at the last minute, uh, they decided in, to support Marwan bin al-Hakam as caliph, as a rival to Khalid bin Yazid. And Marwan was an old man, I mean 62 years old. Um, remember that like Abu Bakr and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they only lived until their early 60s. So this, you're appointing a man who could die at any moment of old age. Um, the life expectancy in these days was very short. You might say the average would have been like 30 years or 40 years was like old. So if you got to 60, I mean, that's like getting to 100 nowadays. Like you were old and you could die anytime, right? So it was, you could see that both Qais and Benu Kalb were in this really, uh, like a crisis mode. They're in this very weak position. They're infighting amongst each other in Syria. Nobody thought anything was going to come out of this. Um, you know, Ibn Zubair had all the power. He was concerned with fighting the Khawarij. He wasn't even concerned with what was happening in Syria to his detriment. Marwan was certainly a, a good choice because he did have a lot of political experience serving under Uthman and Muawiyah. And, but he didn't have the same connections that Muawiyah had or Uthman had. And it was really just Benu Kalb that was supporting him. The, you know, he didn't have the allegiance of Qais. Um, so in Iraq, uh, Benu Kalb and Qais were called Mubar and Tamim. So if you hear Tamimi, um, you know, that refers to Qais. Um, Mubar is Benu Kalb from what I understand. And in Khurasan, they were called Rabi'a and Qais. Um, so just important for if you're reading Tawari or other historical sources, um, sometimes they went by different names in different regions. But these two uh, tribes were spread throughout the Islamic empire, right? And um, the news of all of this uh, quarreling um, had spread, you know, throughout the Islamic empire. So throughout the Islamic empire, you had these two tribes at odds with one another and um, about to go into open conflict. So Qais and Banu Kalb went to all-out warfare in Syria in a battle known as Marj Rahit. And Banu Kalb won, even though they were smaller in number. And it was 
it seemed like they it was more of a slaughter than a real battle, kind of like reminiscent of uh, Ghazwat uh, Nahravan. And so it created this huge rift between the two groups. It's kind of like a family feud, an ancient family feud almost. Um, you know, reminiscent of like if you read uh, Romeo and Juliet, where these two families are feuding at one another another or like today with uh gang warfare in the united states different rival gangs that have a long history of just killing each other right um case and ben Kelb have this long history of killing one another taking revenge on one another getting cuisance on one another and all these things and it, it, it all goes back to this uh time period and even now in contemporary times these two tribes are like rivals and so Marwan was basically elected caliph at that point, and he quickly reconquered Egypt and Iraq, which had been conquered by the Zubayrids. And Marwan's son, Abdul Malik, was named as heir or successor to the throne. Marwan married uh, Yazid bin Muawiyah's widow, um, who was, she was known as Um Khalid in the sources. And so Khalid bin Yazid's mom. And uh, so it was kind of seen as a way to not only give Marwan legitimacy, but I think to also placate Qais. Because Qais, remember, they were supporting Khalid bin Yazid. So by him marrying uh, Khalid bin Yazid's mom, he's creating this political alliance between Qais and Ben Kelb, right? And so they, they both that way could support Marwan without losing faith, without lo losing face, without being like uh, humiliated, right? And um, Marwan's reign lasted for about nine months and he was murdered by Um Khalid, allegedly, Zama, allegedly, who had five slave girls strangle him to death in his sleep. And that's reported by Tobori. And I do think that that's very plausible because um, she wanted her son Khalid to be caliph. Um, Tobori reports that uh, Um Khalid killed Marwan herself by suffocating him with a pillow, which I think is mm, equally, if not more plausible than having five slave girls strangle him to death. Um, but she is thought to be behind it. And Abdul Malik took over the caliphate because he was the one appointed, right? And killed her in retaliation. Um, and El Masudi, who's a Shi'i historian, claims that Marwan died from just a pandemic. Um, Tabori doesn't narrate that, but Tabori does narrate that there was a pandemic during that time. And it was called El Jarif. Um, and we don't know a whole lot about it, don't know what type of illness it was really. Um, so that it's, it's plausible. Um, but this is the issue of, uh, history is you get these different narrations and you don't really know which is true. You could say this is more plausible in my opinion, because X, Y, Z, um, or the chain of narration or you know other factors um novelty you know theoretical factors that you might take into consideration but sometimes it's just you narrate all the different narrations and leave it at that like could be any one of these and so that's essentially how the umayyad caliphate uh began and it set the tone for the rest of the caliphate from here on out it kind of followed that precedent if you will um and like I mentioned before, in Kufa, you had the Muhammad ibn Hanafiya movement rebel, and they, you know, were uh, stamped out, if you will. Um, to this day, the Shia, the all the different branches of the Shia, the Zaydis, which are known as the Fivers, um, the Ismailis, which are known as the Seveners, and the uh, Twelvers or Imami Shia. They all recognize uh, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya as the fourth Imam in their belief system. 
and uh, Abdul Malik bin Marwan had crushed this movement, it's thought, and the Zubayrids uh, and the Kharijite rebellions once and for all. So by 692, all these rebellions were quelled and Umayyad control was firmly implanted until 747 when the Abbasid revolution got started. The Abbasid revolution lasted for three years and wasn't completed until 750. Um, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind. Um, like I mentioned before, how uh, Muawiyah was real good with money. Um, imperial taxes were levied on the people during the Umayyad period where 50% of peasants' crops were taken as taxes. So this is a huge tax. And that goes to show you that um, Islam is not anti-taxes. It's pro-taxes because that money is used for social welfare programs as well as for military and many, many other things, right? That's what kept the empire going. Without it, the caliphate would have uh, undoubtedly collapsed. And without, you know, the wars between Byzantium and the Sassanids that was happening, you know, in the pre-Islamic times, um, the Middle East was a very unified and peaceful place once it was unified uh, by Abdul Malik. And Arabic took off as not only the, obviously, the government, you know, administrative language, but it took off as a lingua franca. So it wasn't spoken in the daily life of the majority of people in the Middle East yet, but a lot of people knew it as a second language. So it was something that people could have some command over if they needed to. And so that, that got established during the Umayyad period. And um, Muslims still remain largely segregated from non-Muslim populations. They were not living intermixed. They still lived in the Amsar or these kind of barracks or garrison towns that were uh, separate from the main city. They were just outside like the main city and they kind of administrated over the city. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. And so people started to convert to Islam but they weren't really recognized as a Muslim convert. Um, they still, a lot of times, had to pay jizya. And uh, they would make certain excuses like, oh, you're not a real Muslim because you can't recite Al-Fatiha. You're not a real Muslim because you don't know Arabic. And um, they said, oh, if you're Muslim, recite Fatiha. I'm waiting. And if they couldn't do it, they would have to pay jizya. Um, so it was kind of problematic. And... Um, Despite that, these a lot of these Muslim converts did get integrated into the Arab tribal system as Mawali or Maula, as kind of kind of like clients. They became part of the tribe and had to follow tribal rules, and um, they had to support the tribe, you know, with this mutual aid. And the tribe would, in return, support and protect them. Um, so that's kind of how these converts started to get integrated into uh, the Umayyad system. Then later on, when Omar II, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, uh, became caliph, he was a big Islamicizing force. It was thought that he was a very pious um, Umayyad caliph. He's probably the most remembered Umayyad caliph and influential, um, you know, after the initial people we just covered. And he changed this culture of discrimination against the non-Auto Muslim converts. So he ordered uh, the first Hadith collections to be compiled. Most notably, uh, he had he tasked the scholar uh, Azuri with this task. Excuse me. And um, he kind of made um, the Umayyad dynasty a much more cosmopolitan, urban place. Um, where many non-Arab um, workers were allowed to work in the empire and government positions. It, it marked kind of a change in direction, and in a sense, it was a illusion or foreshadowing of the Abbasid revolution that was to come, because one of the main reasons for the Abbasid revolution is a lot of Muslim converts were not being recognized 
um, by the uh, Umayyad dynasty. And it's ironic because uh, when we learn about Islamic Spain, the same thing happened in Islamic Spain, and Islamic Spain was ruled over by um, Umayyad refugees who left during the Abbasid Revolution. So they ran away from the central Islamic lands and went and ruled over Islamic Spain. And they just repeated the same mistake of not giving uh, the Muslim converts um, adequate recognition. And it seemed like the Umayyads, their, that clan, always had uh, a problem of kind of being e what we call nowadays as elitist, um, not really recognizing the lower strata of society and uh, giving them their due rights, if you will. Um, so that was always kind of their, their pitfall or their downfall or their, uh, their fallible quality, if you will. And so Ira Lapidus, or Lapidus, um, he's a professor at the University of Berkeley. He's a uh, sociologist of Islam. So, well, he, he's a historian, but he does sociological history. So he focuses on what's going on amongst the regular people, amongst society, rather than just the caliphs. And what he says about the Umayyad time period is that in the course of the first Muslim century, the Arabs changed from a clan or tribal people into an urban people. And so they mingled with non-Arab peoples. They, you know, during uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz's time, they left these uh, garrison towns and they started to integrate into the city with the non-Arab people, it became this urban cosmopolitan um, empire. They abandoned the military affairs. You know, the expansion by that point was kind of, uh, stagnant or at a stalemate, they weren't as concerned with it. They drove to look internally and introspectively and domestically, if you will. And non-Arab peoples entered the military and government services, converted to Islam, adopted the Arabic language, and uh, not completely, but you know, as a lingua franca, and claimed a place in the government of the empire in which they were initially subjects or like a lower status, right? Economic and social change in the garrison centers, and that's like Kufa and Fustat and, and so on, conversions and shared languages paved the way for the society of the future, no longer divided between Arab conqueror and conquered peoples, but united on the basis of their commitment to Islam or the empire sharing an Arabic and or Persian linguistic identity. This mutual assimilation of peoples and the emergence of Islamic Middle Eastern communities took place, however, only in a restricted number of garrison centers. Although the rest of the Middle Eastern population remained outside the influence of new societies, these very rural populations that the government couldn't quite reach, as I mentioned before. Still bound to their more ancient heritage, the cosmopolitan communities set the tone of Middle Eastern politics and culture for centuries to come.